Welcome back. The recent findings of a three-year investigation into wrongful convictions worldwide by Civil Liberties Australia has found that approximately 300 Australian women and men convicted of major crimes in jail today and for many years to come should be free. They are innocent. That equates to about 7% of murderers and rapists or one in every 14 cases are wrongful convictions. Here are just four of Australia's most well-known miscarriages of justice. The book, Broken Lives by Estelle Blackburn, was pivotal in seeing the exoneration of two of the people in today's video. I'll give the details on how you can win a free copy of her book at the end of this video. On the 9th of February 1963, John Button was celebrating his 19th birthday with a dinner at his parents' home in Fremantle, Perth. Until he and his girlfriend, Rosemary Anderson, aged 17, had an argument. Rosemary stormed out of the house and started to walk home. John jumped into his car, a 1962 Simca Aronde, and followed her, trying to persuade her to get in, but she was determined to walk. When she disappeared under a train track subway, John stopped the car, lit a cigarette and waited. He knew that on the other side was a deserted industrial strip. He thought the darkness might make her change her mind, but when he drove through four or five minutes later, John spotted Rosemary lying in the sand several metres from the road, injured and unconscious. He carried the bleeding girl to his car and rushed her to a doctor's surgery. The doctor called an ambulance and the police. When the police arrived, they noticed damage to the left front corner of Button's car. He told them he had had a minor accident when he ran into the back of a Ford Prefect car three weeks before and had not had the damage fixed. The police turned up a report of the accident but disregarded it. Button looked suspicious. He was the boyfriend. There had been an argument. He was on the scene. There was damage to the car and there was blood in the car. Button also had a bad stutter which investigating police took his nervousness at the questions he was being asked. After about five hours in police custody, during which he says he was roughed up quite a bit, and learning that his girlfriend had died in hospital, Button signed a confession that had been typed out by a detective. The jury at his trial convicted him of manslaughter and he was sentenced to 10 years hard labour. There his case would have rested had it not been for the arrest four months later of Eric Edgar Cook, a 32-year-old father of seven who had confessed to eight murders, including the killing of Button's girlfriend, Rosemary Anderson. Cook provided great detail of how he had spotted Rosemary just after she walked under the subway, waited for the traffic to clear, then lined her up with a car he'd stolen that night, a 1962 Holden. He described how she flew over the bonnet, over the roof and disappeared. He had then driven the car to a park three kilometres away and crashed it into a tree to disguise the damage. The Holden's owner was contacted and he and police records confirmed that his car was found crashed into a tree in Kings Park the next morning, just as Cook described. Eric Cook had also confessed to the murder of 22-year-old Gillian Brewer, for which another man, Darrell Beamish, was serving time. As would be expected, John Button appealed on the basis of Cook's confession. Cook gave evidence at the appeal, but the judges, already sickened by the details of his other crimes, refused to believe anything he said. They believed he was inventing the story to delay the death sentence he'd been handed for other murders. Cook was hanged in October 1964, and John Button was released from jail after serving five years of his sentence, 
but he never gave up trying to clear his name. John's brother approached journalist Estelle Blackburn in January 1992, claiming his older brother had been framed for a murder committed by Eric Cook. Though sceptical, Blackburn met John Button in February 1992. After hearing his testimony and reading the appeal books kept from his previous court actions, she decided that his case would be an appropriate topic for a book. Once granted access to police archives, Blackburn discovered that the police had not emphasised the behaviour pattern of Cook in their public statements. They made no public announcement that Cook had attacked seven other women, five in hit and runs. The book's publication received wide publicity and the new evidence led to the Western Australia Attorney General agreeing to reopen John Button's case. Public expectations were raised that the new evidence would exonerate Button. A major problem with Eric Cook's evidence at John Button's original appeal was that the car he stole was fitted with a steel sun visor. The appeal judges simply did not believe that a body could have been flung over the top of the car and thrown well to the left hand side without being caught by the visor or ripping it off. They ridiculed Cook but he stuck firmly to his story in the witness box. A search for the world's leading expert on pedestrian crashes found William Haight in the United States. He is a former police officer and is well qualified in both the theory and practice of pedestrian crash reconstruction. Haight agreed to review the available evidence. He brought with him a biomedical human form dummy that behaves exactly as a human body in a pedestrian crash situation. He purchased three 1962 Simca sedans and a 1962 Holden sedan. The tests were designed to show whether the prior accident damage to Button's car could have masked further damage caused by an impact with Miss Anderson. Haight also wanted to measure the displacement of the dummy to one side of the car. Miss Anderson's body was found well off the road. Different vehicle profiles cause different displacement distances. The Holden has a square fronted look while the Simkas have rounded lines. At the test venue, video recorded the impacts from various angles for court purposes, including cameras inside the cars. Still photos were also taken before, during and after the tests. The three Simkas were crash tested at speeds of 27, 31 and 37 miles per hour. The amount of damage to each car varied with the speed, but its position on the cars was consistent. It was stark and obvious in each case. The leading edges of the cars sustained some damage and there were pronounced dents to the rear of the bonnets caused by the dummy's head striking the metal. Because of the shape of the front of the Simca, the dummy was flung to one side before contacting the windscreen and ended up on the road within a metre of the side of the vehicle. The three test Simcas sustained none of the damage shown in the police photos of Mr Button's car. And Mr Button's car had none of the massive bonnet damage suffered by the test cars. Mr Haight was able to declare immediately that Button Simca could not have struck Miss Anderson with sufficient force to kill her or even seriously injure her. It also failed to displace the body more than about one metre to the side of the car, nothing like the two to three metres described by witnesses at the time. The Holden was fitted with a visor to check the veracity of Eric Cook's statement that he'd driven the car at the girl at 35 to 40 miles per hour and that she'd been flung over the top of the car. Mr Haight hit the dummy with the Holden at 35 miles per hour, just to the left of the bonnet. To everyone's surprise, the dummy behaved quite differently from when it was hit by the Simkas. The Holden sustained quite severe damage to the leading edge of its bonnet and some head damage to the rear of the bonnet. The dummy then cartwheeled towards the roof of the car. 
It struck the visor above the left-hand side of the windscreen. Mr Haith said in his evidence that the visor did play a role in the body motion, but not the role suggested by the Crown at Button's original appeal in 1964. The visor flexed and distorted, but popped back into its original shape without even cracking the paint. The contact with the visor caused the dummy to deflect laterally to the left of the car, a distance of 6.5 feet, well within the range described by the witnesses who came upon the original crash in 1963. Mr Haight was able to declare in court that the death of Rosemary Anderson could have occurred exactly as Eric Cook had described it, but that it was not possible for John Button's car to have killed her. Three Court of Criminal Appeal judges accepted his evidence, emphasised the importance of the sun visor evidence and quashed John Button's conviction. The judges said Mr Haight's evidence was compelling and convincing. It was the longest time lapse between conviction and exoneration in Australia's legal history. Button had fought for 40 long years to clear his name. Now, aged 75, he spearheads the Western Australian Innocence Project, which aims to free the wrongfully convicted. On the morning of December 21st, 1959, the body of West Australian socialite and McRobertson's chocolate heiress, Gillian Brewer, was found naked in bed in her Cottleslow flat. She had been gruesomely attacked and mutilated with a tomahawk, a knife and a pair of dressmaking scissors and left to bleed to death. Police arrested 18-year-old Daryl Beamish for the murder. While apparently not mentally deficient, Beamish was profoundly deaf and lacked social and communication skills. He'd had some minor convictions for non-violent sex offences but there was no direct or forensic evidence linking Beamish with the crime. The prosecution produced a bizarre confession allegedly made by Beamish to the police, which was in fact impossible for him to have written. It would later be revealed that the confession was obtained by Beamish repeating back to his interrogators details of the crime as told to him through an interpreter. How much Beamish understood the proceedings is very questionable. His lack of comprehension was confirmed at the time by a reporter who'd been covering the trial. Prosecutor Ronald Wilson belaboured the jury with psychological theories he apparently invented on the spur of the moment, and he failed to disclose to the defence that not only Beamish, but anyone might have entered Gillian Brewer's flat. This failure of disclosure was not only contrary to the practice of law, but also a breach of the provisions of the Justices Act. Beamish was sentenced to be hanged, but the sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. Beamish appealed to the Court of Criminal Appeal on the grounds that the trial judge's directions were in error and his confession was involuntary and should have been ruled inadmissible. The appeal was dismissed on the 20th of October 1961 and an application for leave to appeal to the High Court of Australia was also dismissed on the 11th of December 1961. Serial killer Eric Edgar Cook, who became known as the Night Caller, confessed to the murder of Gillian Brewer on the 10th of September 1963. Cook had also confessed to the hit-and-run murder of 17-year-old Rosemary Anderson, for which John Button had been convicted. Cook gave details of how he'd entered Brewer's flat, which only the killer could have known. Beamish filed a petition to the Attorney-General, which was referred to the Court of Criminal Appeal. The court dismissed the reference on the 22nd of May 1964. Wolf CJ, who had also been the trial judge, held that the case against Beamish was strong and described Cook as a palpable and unscrupulous liar.
The appeal was dismissed. A further application for special leave to appeal to the High Court was also dismissed on the 14th of September 1964, as was an appeal to the Privy Council. Darrell Beamish served 15 years before being released. Western Australian journalist Estelle Blackburn's book, Broken Lives, prompted an appeal by John Button for the hit and run murder of his girlfriend which Eric Cook had also confessed to committing. The success of Button's appeal raised doubts about the Court of Criminal Appeals' reasons for rejecting Cook's confession in Beamish's 1964 appeal. After six overturned appeals, the conviction of Darrell Beamish was finally overturned on April 1st, 2005, 44 years after his conviction. Perth lawyers Tom Percy QC and Jonathan Davies had worked pro bono on both men's appeals for seven years from 1998. They were awarded the Australian Lawyers Alliance West Australian Civil Justice Award for their efforts in exposing injustices in the West Australian legal system. Andrew Mallard was born in England in 1962 and raised in Perth, Western Australia. Mallard, who had a troubled adolescence and was often bullied, dropped out of school at the age of 16. As a young adult, Mallard was unemployed, had psychological difficulties and by 1994 was homeless and living at his girlfriend's Mosman Park apartment. On May 23, 1994, 45-year-old Pamela Lawrence had been left alone at her trendy jewellery store, Flora Metallica. Around 5.02pm, a staff member's school-aged daughter passed by the shop and saw a stranger standing behind the counter. He was described as a tall Caucasian man with a beard who was wearing a bandana. Lawrence's husband, Peter, became worried when his wife didn't return home that evening. Unable to reach her by phone, he drove to Flora Metallica, where he found his wife barely alive. Lawrence succumbed to her injuries en route to hospital. Nothing had been taken from the jewellery store, so robbery was scratched as a motive. But detectives revealed that Lawrence had been struck over the head 12 times with a blunt object. Whoever had killed her seemed to have been in a frenzy. Friends and family members said Lawrence had no known enemies. Andrew Mallard had been arrested the same day for breaking into the apartment of an ex-boyfriend of his current girlfriend. He was an immediate murder suspect. After being released from jail for the break-in at around 4pm, he arrived by taxi back at his girlfriend's apartment an hour later. Mallard had no previous history of violent behaviour and there was no blood, DNA or trace evidence found either on Mallard or at the crime scene. Mallard was questioned by police for 12 hours, all the while proclaiming his innocence. When police asked him, hypothetically, what the murderer could have done, Mallard simply gave his opinion, which was then submitted as a confession. He was later submitted to a polygraph exam and was regressed using hypnosis. Both the polygraph examiner and hypnotherapist believed Mallard did not commit the murder, but the confession was deemed as enough and Mallard was eventually sentenced to life in prison. In 2006, a High Court overturned Mallard's sentence after a bloody handprint left at the scene was presented. The handprint turned out to be a positive match for Simon Rochford, a convicted felon already incarcerated for the 1995 murder of his girlfriend, Brigitte Davis. Rochford had admitted to bludgeoning Davis using a stick with a heavy weight attached. 
A cold case review of the Lawrence murder was opened, which revealed that a weapon recovered at the 1995 Davis murder scene had blue paint that matched paint found in Rochford's backpack and Lawrence's wounds. While the murders were similar, the weapon recovered in 1995 was never presented to clear Mallard's name. The stick and weight used by Rochford were found in 2013 during an audit of police exhibits. The Corruption and Crime Commission demanded to see the weapon in 2007. However, commissioners were told it could not be located. Shadow Attorney General John Quigley said what has happened and what is happening now has the stench of a cover-up. It is very serious and the government should come out and say how long they have known about this. The police should come out now and produce the court order that they claim ordered the destruction of this vital piece of evidence. In 2008, the Triple C recommended that disciplinary action be considered against two assistant police commissioners and the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions at the time over their earlier roles in the Mallard case. All three resigned from their positions. Simon Rochford committed suicide in 2006 at Albany Prison, where he was serving his sentence for the Davis murder. He killed himself within hours of learning he'd been publicly named as the suspect in Lawrence's death. In 2010, Mallard told ABC Australia, I was wrongfully imprisoned. There's a stigma that goes with that and will follow me all of my life. They framed me for a murder I did not commit. ABC Australia also spoke with journalist Colleen Egan, who investigated the case and came to a similar conclusion. She said, It was just a cruel twist of fate that put Mallard on a collision course with this inquiry. And it was just a matter of fact that there were police who were willing to act dishonestly. She added, There was a prosecutor willing to run a case that wasn't quite right and there were three judges who refused to believe it when evidence was put in front of them. Andrew Mallard was exonerated and received a multi-million dollar settlement. He relocated to the UK and on April 18th this year, 2019, was in Los Angeles where his fiancée lived. As he walked along West Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood around 1.30 a.m., he was struck by a silver car that stopped briefly, then sped off without rendering any assistance. A bystander attempted CPR, but Mallard died at the scene. On the afternoon of the 30th of December, 1921, the grandmother of Alma Turchki sent the 12 year old on an errand. She was to collect a package of meat from a butcher shop in Swanston Street, Melbourne, and take it a short distance to Collins Street to deliver it to her aunt. The errand should have taken no more than 15 minutes, and when Alma, who was known to be reliable and obedient, failed to return home, her grandmother became alarmed. Alma was reported as missing, and the police, along with the Turchki's family, searched for Alma throughout the night. Early the next morning, her naked body was found in Gun Alley, a laneway off Little Collins Street, near the address Alma had been sent to. She had been raped and strangled. The case became a major sensation, with the Melbourne press convincing its readers that a maniac was on the loose and likely to strike again. A reward of £1,250 was offered for the capture of the killer, one of the highest rewards offered in Australia at that time. As time passed with no real progress, the police were criticised and were subjected to public pressure to make an arrest. Investigations revealed that Alma had last been seen alive between 2.30 and 3pm on the afternoon of her disappearance at the corner of Alfred Place and Little Collins Street, near the lane in which her body was subsequently discovered. 
and that she had been murdered at around 6 p.m. Among the numerous men interviewed was Colin Ross, a saloon manager, who described seeing a girl matching Alma's description outside his saloon. His description of events closely matched that of several witnesses who had also seen her. They recounted how Alma looked worried, with one stating that a man seemed to be following her. Colin Ross was well known to the local police, having recently been acquitted on a charge relating to his alleged involvement in the shooting and robbing of one of his customers. Despite Ross's willingness to cooperate, police began to interview him in greater detail. He was able to nominate several witnesses who had seen him tending his saloon on the afternoon of Alma's death and who would confirm that he had not left the premises, but the police remained convinced that he was their killer. And on the 12th of January, 1922, they arrested him for murder. The public fascination with the case intensified as newspapers published news of Ross's arrest. But Ross told his lawyers, family and friends that he had nothing to fear. As an innocent man, he said, it was only a matter of time before he would be released. The trial began on the 20th of February, 1922, and witnesses were produced to attest to Ross's guilt. John Harding, who had a previous conviction for perjury and was being detained in prison at the time, testified that Ross had confided to him in prison and had admitted his guilt. Hardy was given a lighter sentence for his testimony. Ivy Matthews, Olive Maddox, a prostitute, and Julia Gibson, who worked as a fortune teller under the name Madame Gurkha, also testified in court that Ross had confessed the crime to them. The women shared the reward money equally among themselves. The prosecution's case was that 12-year-old Alma had chosen to have a drink in Ross's wine bar instead of collecting the package for her auntie and had remained there consensually from 3pm until 6pm drinking wine, at which time Ross had raped and murdered her. The prosecution offered forensic evidence in the form of several strands of hair that obtained from Alma Turchki shortly before her funeral. A detective testified that on the day of Ross's arrest, he'd noticed several strands of golden hair on a blanket in Ross's house, which were later removed and examined by the state government analyst Charles Price, who was a trained chemist but had little previous experience in the new field of forensic science. Price testified that he compared the hairs under a microscope and concluded that the hair found in Ross's house was a light auburn colour, while Alma's hair was a dark red. He measured the diameter of the hairs and concluded that they were of a different thickness. At one point in his testimony, he commented that the hairs on Ross's blanket had most likely fallen from the head of a regular visitor, such as Ross's girlfriend. But after a long testimony and cross-examination, he then stated that he believed the hairs were derived from the scalp of one and the same person, Alma Turchki. His contradictory evidence was accepted by the judge without comment. Defence barrister Thomas Brennan protested requesting that a further examination be carried out by a more qualified person, but the judge refused. The jury found Ross guilty of murder and he was sentenced to death by hanging. His legal representatives were convinced of his innocence, but found that public opinion remained strongly against Ross, and news of his death sentence was met with public celebration. Ross's legal representatives sought to obtain the right to appeal, but this was refused by the judge, who stated that Ross's guilt had been proven beyond doubt. Brennan sought leave to appeal to the Privy Council in England, but that application was also refused. Brennan remained supportive of Ross and certain of his innocence, but had exhausted all avenues in his attempt to save him from execution. 
On the eve of his hanging, Ross received a letter from a man who failed to give his name, but admitted that he had killed Alma. And although consumed by guilt, was not willing to come forward as it would cause grief to his family. Brennan later wrote that he believed the letter could have been authentic. The letter may have been written by the real killer. Before his execution, in a farewell letter to his family, Ross wrote, the day is coming when my innocence will be proved. Ross composed himself with dignity for his quiet but resolute statement from the scaffold. He said, I am now face to face with my maker and I swear by almighty God that I am an innocent man. I never saw the child. I never committed the crime and I don't know who did. I never confessed to anyone. I ask God to forgive those who have sworn my life away and I pray God to have mercy on my poor mother and my family. Ross was executed on the 24th of April 1922 at Melbourne Jail in a particularly gruesome manner. Authorities had decided to experiment with a four-strand rope rather than usual three-strand European hemp. The four-strand rope did not run freely through the noose and Ross did not die immediately because his spinal cord was fractured, not severed. Although his windpipe was torn and obstructed by his destroyed larynx, the condemned man continued with grasping breaths and convulsed on the rope. Three times Ross bent his knees and flexed his arms before succumbing, slowly strangled to death by asphyxiation. A prison report later ruled that such a rope must never be used again. Thomas Brendan became consumed with his failure to save the life of Colin Ross, eventually writing a book, The Gun Alley Tragedy, in which he attempted to establish that Ross had been hanged for a crime he did not commit. Although Brennan attracted supporters, it was not enough to persuade the Victorian government to have the case re-examined, and over the following years, interest began to wane. In 1993, former school teacher Kevin Morgan became interested in the case and began to research the events surrounding the murder of Alma Turchke. He read handwritten notes in the Bible Colin had kept with him in prison and which had been preserved by his family following his death. Morgan was moved by the simple notations in which Ross wrote of false witnesses, knowing that Ross had written these notes without expecting anyone else to read them. Morgan examined interview records and court transcripts and discovered information that had been kept from the court at the time, including the testimony of six reliable witnesses who placed Ross inside his saloon for the entire afternoon of Alma Turchke's murder. Furthermore, a cab driver, Joseph Graham, had heard screams coming from a building in Collins Street at 3 p.m during the time that Ross was verified as having been in the saloon. On the 4th of October 2005, the families of both Colin Ross and Alma Turchke submitted a petition for mercy. On the 23rd of October 2006, the Victorian Attorney General, Rob Holes, forwarded the 31-page petition to the Chief Justice, Marilyn Warren, requesting her to consider the plea for Ross. The subsequent pardon, granted on the 27th of May 2008, is the first example of a posthumous pardon in Victoria's legal history and is to date the only instance of a pardon for a judicially executed person in Australia. In October 2010, Ross's remains were identified and handed to his family for a proper burial. As a thank you to our valued subscribers, I'd love to give away a brand new copy of the book Broken Lives by Estelle Blackburn. It covers the story of infamous Perth serial killer, Eric Edgar Cook, known as the Nightcaller, as well as the details of two of the innocent men who were convicted for his murders. All you need to do is be a subscriber of this channel and leave a comment below. 
The draw will be live on Monday the 30th of September at 5pm Australian Central Standard Time. The winner will be chosen using a random YouTube comment picker and you don't need to be present during the live to win. I'll reply to the winning comment to let you know. Once again, thanks for watching. Until next time.